charge of recording. Excellent. Okay, great. Excellent. It's uh, all going. Okay, I, I just wanted to um, I just wanted to ask you, Farouz, if you receive a photograph that I sent. When did you send it, Louise? I, I sent it about five minutes ago. Oh no. No, I'm sorry, but I can give it to Mariam. Yes. She, she is chairing today. So okay. I'm going to email it to her right away. Okay, that's really good because um, well, I think it's important that people see this photograph so that they can understand um, maybe a um, well, I, I'll, I'll explain the photograph once we see it. Sure, <laughs> sure, by all means. I'm trying to find it and I'll send it. By the way, why, uh, while I'm doing that, Professor Shayu, how are you? Welcome, welcome. It's so hi. wonderful hi, to see you. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi, hi. Oh, it's just so nice to see everybody this evening. It's been such a warm, very unusually warm day. And it's very windy here. I don't know whether it's very windy in, in yes. Toronto. Yes, I heard that it was very windy there. And um, I phoned home, I phoned to the Yukon today and it's minus 39 degrees. So it's, it's a bit cold. <laughs> Did you find did you find the photograph? I'm, yes, I'm I just, just sent it to Mariam. Mariam, did you receive it? I haven't yet. I'm just um I'm okay. just waiting for it. Okay. Louise, do you want us to put it up right now or how would you yeah. well I'm sure that you're gonna be welcoming everybody and then uh, just yeah. when you introduce me okay. then we can put it up then. Okay. Just Thank give you. me a second. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> so thank you so much, Louise, for being here. I'd like to start this evening with the land acknowledgement. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are hosting these Thursday night presentations on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Atawandaran peoples. Mm -hmm. And we acknowledge that it is through their existence, sacrifice, and resilience that we can be safe here today. I'm going to now, if you just give me a second, because I just got this. Uh, you just got it. Well, it, it's okay because um, I'll, I'll tell you when we can put it up. Okay. I'm just right gonna now. Do... Right now, I'm just um, offering a bit of sage, burning some sage. Uh, for all of you, so that we have a nice evening together. I bring blessings for all of you, your family, for all of those who might be ill, for all of those who are traveling, and for all of those who are seeking along their spiritual journey. So we'll offer a bit of smudge here tonight, and I will open with a little prayer in my language. And I also wanted to acknowledge the fact that I live in Algonquin territory now. I'm originally from the Yukon, from the Nacho Nayaktan First Nation, but I've been living here for 19 years. A good number. So, so um, I would you like to say the prayer first, Louise, or should I introduce you first? It's up to you. Yeah, I, I think we should call on the spirit, call on the, the great spirit. And uh, this is a prayer that was um, actually is translated. It's from the Bob. And the Bob is, of course, reminding us that um, God suffices all things. And we should be grateful for that. The Janak Neo Taringioka. No Jighe at Hachu.
This is the second time this year that we're fortunate enough to have uh, Louise Prophet LeBlanc with us. I, I believe many of, uh, of you were with us for um, her first presentation, which was uh, extremely uh, deeply moving presentation uh, about her aunt Molly uh, that was a survivor of, or that was not a survivor, I'm sorry, of, of a residential school. And uh, it, I, I, I do recall that Louise had to burn an extra, some extra sage for me that evening. So thank you very much for that, Louise. Um, we are fortunate enough to have her again with us this evening. And the title of her presentation is called Indigenous Ways of Knowing. Uh, I think that's, you know, I um, just when I watch the news and I see all of the environmental catastrophes that are happening around us, and um, I see the response of Indigenous peoples around the world and around where these catastrophes are taking place um, and, and where, where all of these catastrophes could have been prevented had Indigenous ways of knowing um, been used. Uh, and I speak specifically in Canada about the, uh, the fires in, in BC that um, could have been prevented by uh, the traditional burning um, of the forests that the indigenous people of that area uh, would always undertake because of the fact that um, to, to avoid the kind of fires that, that uh, BC was facing over the summer. And so I think indigenous ways of knowing are ways of knowing that um, we must, um, and it is critical, that we all learn and deeply acquaint ourselves with. So we're very lucky um, to have people like Louise who are amongst us and are um, able to uh, teach us um, those ways of knowing and help us become acquainted to, with uh, those ways of knowing. Um, Louise is from the Nacho Nyak Dan First Nation of Northeastern Yukon, um, as she herself said. Uh, Nacho means big river, and uh, she was born um, and was raised in her childhood beside um, this big river. And uh, she lived with her grandmother uh, until uh, she was uh, left uh, left uh, her grandmother's house and was um, was taken to a residential school. Um, she left the residential school after grade three when her grandmother realized that she wasn't um, being given the spiritual education that her grandmother had a vision for for her. And uh, she became an international, internationally renowned artist, poet, and storyteller. Her art um, and her, her poetry uh, reflect on the intersection of her identity as an indigenous artist as well as her identity as a Baha'i. Um, and she works for the promotion and the preservation of uh, indig indigenous traditions, uh, stories and art. Um, in that capacity, uh, Louise co-founded the Yukon International Storytelling Festival and the Society of Yukon Artists. Uh, Louise was also the coordinator of the uh, Aboriginal Affairs, Aboriginal Arts Office of the Canadian Council for the Arts. Uh, she was a longtime member of the National Spiritual Assembly of the Baha'is of Canada, and uh, we're very lucky to have her here this evening. Thank you, Louise. I'm going to share my screen now with the picture, yes? Yes, please. Did you do you see the photo? Yeah, not yet. I'm just bringing it up. Okay. I'm not as techy as I would like to be. I'm with you. <laughs> Excellent. 
um, this is my people. It looks like she's, she's getting ready uh, for Christmas. My name is Tse Itzo, which means beaver woman. And um, this evening, friends, um, I've been asked to talk about indigenous ways of knowing. Of course, there are many ways of knowing. And I just wanted you to uh, acknowledge my people, but also truly friends, we should laugh. This is so funny to me. <laughs> I don't know where this beaver got this little branch of, uh, it's a, he's, it looks like he's, or she stole a little Christmas tree from, from somewhere near her house. That's her house there. And uh, they den up there in the winter. And a wonderful thing about beavers, many people don't know, they have two homes. They have a house like this for their family. They bring a lot of food into this house. They work all summer long. And then they have another house, which my grandmother referred to as a danger house, uh, which is another house in case of danger, because sometimes these houses are torn down by wolves or by bears or by coyotes. And so they have to seek the shelter of a safe home so that's why my grandmother call it danger house. And so, well, I just thought that this is very humorous. My friend sent it to me today. She knows my name is a it's o which means a beaver woman. So you can take it down now. Thank you, Miriam. Let's see. In my language, when we say thank you, we say masi. And um I should tell you that in the uh, indigenous language, the Nachunayaktan language, we don't have a word for thank you. So merci actually comes from merci, from the French, because we had a lot of French people that came north. So cho, cho means big, doesn't necessarily mean in size. Uh, cho could mean you're very learned, you are an elder, or you have some skills uh, that you have acquired throughout your lifetime. So I would say, Farouz uh, Cho, meaning that if she is respected in her community as a, as a woman who knows things. So I just wanted to let you know that. <clears throat> um, I, have, um, I have some things that I wanted to share with you this evening that will bring together several areas, areas of study, if you will. If we are uh, trying to learn more about indigenous people and the most effective way that I think this can happen is through hearing stories. And uh, several of my friends and, and several of them are, are Baha'is as well, indigenous Baha'is. And we've come to acknowledge and recognize that one of the most beautiful traits, the most beautiful um, characteristic of our beloved master was that he loved to tell stories. And so if we were to look to him as an example, then we, we should be able to pull this from our tradition, from our cultural tradition of storytelling. Why is storytelling important? Why is it important for children? Well, in a hunter-gatherer society, a child has to learn how to be uh, still, how to be quiet and how to listen, listen to their environment, listen to what is going on in the bush, or as many of my non-native friends refer to this as nature. We refer to it as home. We refer to it as, as the bush. Uh, the, and this is um, our home as well. So when children were, um, 
very small and I know I can say that I have such lovely memories, sweet memories of being in my grandmother's big bed with my siblings. And she would be telling us stories at night, have all of her little grandchildren around her. And we, be, we would sit quietly and we would listen. And then the younger ones would go off to sleep. And the older ones, including myself, we would continue to listen to a story. And of course, I would eventually drop off. The next evening, if we were staying there for several days, my grandmother would say, okay, Louise, you tell the story up until the time you went to sleep. <laughs> I was not ready for that. I didn't realize how important it was. So I, I, I made sure that I listened so that I could tell the story. So if you are trying to train a hunter, or you are trying to help your children to recognize that in order to survive, you have to learn how to be quiet. You have to learn how to sit still. You might sit at the fishing hole if you're fishing on the ice for hours. What does that teach a child? It teaches a child great patience. It teaches a child to depend on the creator for survival. It's about survival. Now, as you are all very much aware, many of the indigenous children were removed from this academy, from these schools of loving embrace of their parents, of their uncles, their aunties, the whole community ensured that every child would learn to be able to be effective caregivers, effective um, providers, uh, and learn how to survive together. So those are some of the things that I think is very important for us, particularly since um, a child, even before birth, and there's many practices in indigenous community where as soon as the woman uh, becomes knowledgeable that she is pregnant, then this is a time for the man to also become involved. And I do recollect at, at a health conference in the Yukon, a man uh, came to one of the workshops that was primarily for women. And it was for women uh, who were pregnant for pregnancy to learn more about the traditional ways of pregnancy. And this man came in and he said, he was an elder. He said, where are all the men? He asked us, the or organizers, he said, where are all your men? And we said, oh, this is a woman's uh, workshop. He said, no, you must have men here. So we went and we, we found a few men and we dragged them in there to hear this elder. He said, when your wife becomes pregnant, as soon as she knows, you have to start to build a relationship with your unborn child. Your child has to hear your voice as well as his mother's. He hears the drumbeat in her heart, but he doesn't hear yours. So you have to introduce yourself to him or her. You tell the baby you're going to be a very good person. You're going to be a wonderful human being. You're going to be a good hunter. You're going to give to the community. You're going to be strong, whatever the father would like to have for the child whether the child is a boy or a girl, because many of those tasks of hunting, fishing, providing, were the, they were practiced by both men and women. Those responsibilities were not divided. So this is what he told the young boys. Now, when you find a woman, he said, and you get married, 
and you decide to have children, this is your responsibility. Every evening, he said, you sit with your wife in bed. You hold her around her middle, the, her mid middle of her body, around her tummy, and you talk to your baby. I thought that was so beautiful. So this is what we would call oral tradition. And we didn't have any written books. Perhaps things were written into different art designs, symbols were read, um, different stories might in fact even be beaded onto a garment. You might, if you, if you knew the story, you can interpret from the, from the garment. Um, but we didn't have a written language per se. Our written language was written into our heart, into our mind, how to behave, how to become more human. When I was a child and I heard these stories, I asked my grandmother, how is it that animals can talk? She said, that's before we were more human. We behaved like animals that time. I was very surprised. She said, now we're no longer animals, so we don't behave like that, and they lost the language. So in and amongst all of this, um, of learning through story, we are learning about our higher nature. If we are sitting in silence, and the room is quiet. Our mind is not quiet. We're always hearing a story within ourselves. Something that's ha happened today, something that you're dealing with. So this is our inner spirit. And these are the things that I believe is, is a healing for the people. So this is, um, something that I've been working at. I've been mentoring young storytellers. Just had six graduates, I'm so happy. And to work with them from the beginning of their story until they developed it and, sh and shared it. And in all of this, in the midst of all of this that's happening in the world, and you mentioned those things at, at the top of our program tonight, Miriam, that what is going on in the world today with regards to our environment, with regards to disease all over the world, uh, warring, all of these things. What is the underlying purpose? It's to strengthen us. It's to make us love each other, help each other. God never tests a soul beyond his capacity. We know that. God will never test us beyond our capacity. But as of recent, and you all heard about these children who were found in unmarked graves, and this has caused a great stirring in our country, a stirring of what to do. What can you do? What can I do to improve our understanding so that we can stand side by side, accompanying each other as we learn, as my grandmother said, to be more human, to be a better human. So how do, we, how do we kind of move from this paralysis? It's almost that some people are still in a state of shock. Some people are, you know, so worried about things that we're almost paralyzed. We don't know what to do. And this is why we have to pray more. We have to consider what is justice? What is justice? What is the purpose of justice. This is always in my mind. 
and it's been in my mind since since I recognize that the master has given indigenous people a responsibility. He refers to us as the standard bearers. When I first read that from Abdul Baha, I was astounded. But the more I recognize that our association with each other to survive, of course, and we're from, we're from North America. He only spoke to the North American indigenous people. He said, these Indians, should they be educated and guided? There can be no doubt that they will become illumined as to enlighten the whole world. That was frightening for me at the beginning. I should tell you, friends, I can tell you that honestly, that was frightening for me. But now, of course, I have grown a bit. And I realized that indigenous people will not do this by themselves. All of you here, you're my helper. We are helping each other so we can go forward. And Shogi Effendi, this is another quote that I just really was so moved by. And I, in speaking with Rhea Khanum, she also inculcated in myself that Indigenous people have a special role and that I shouldn't run from it. I should run to it. I should be happy to take this as a service. And Shogi Effendi said, if the light of guidance enters properly into the lives of the Indians or indigenous people as we refer to ourselves now, it will be found that they will arise with great power and become an example of a spirituality and culture to all of the people in these countries. So we can be very grateful that Shulgi Effendi also um, very much promoted this activity for Indigenous people. So what is oral tradition? And I'm sure that, well, anytime I've been with my Persian friends, they're always telling stories. And so that's a, that's a common thread. Whenever I'm with my African friends, it's a common thread. We start telling stories. We make each other laugh. We make each other cry. These are all emotional things of the heart. And it's so, it's so wonderful to acknowledge that this is what our heart is supposed to help us to do. To be able to be fully human, one must cry. That's why my grandmother said, you see this? That's a tear duct, that's for crying, she said. It's okay to cry. When you're feeling pain, that's a human response. So that was uh, something that I learned from her. And to be happy. Abdul Baha also said, for what day do you wait to be happy? <laughs> so that's another very common um, characteristic of indigenous people, we can always find something to laugh about, which is a wonderful quality, despite the conditions we have had to face in our lives. So I just wanted to mention that oral traditions are for learning different spiritual things, perhaps different traditional cultural practices, learning how to interact with each other. How do you stay unified? These are some of the things. Also to envision a future. How do we envision a future for all of us? There were some people that had responsibilities and these people were called the dreamers. In the spring, it's very dangerous uh, when you are traveling on foot 
or on with a dog team to go across a river in the spring because you don't know if the ice is safe. And so the person who was given this gift of seeing would gather some women who were very good prayers to come into a tent. And this man, and I knew one of these men, his name was Lane, Lane, Johnny. And he invited the several women in. And the woman who told me this story, she said, I was a little girl the last time I saw this in our community. And he asked the women to come and pray. And he danced. He danced, he sang. All the women sat around the circle and prayed. And children are not supposed to be in there, but this, the woman that told me this story, she said, I was such a crybaby. And my mom said, you have to stay behind me so he doesn't see you. So this is how she witnessed. And he had a little birch bark cup in the middle of the tent, which he had poured some water into. And he, he danced around that cup and he drummed. He drummed and he sang. And then he came over to my mama, she said. She's talking about her when she was a little girl. And she took her, her head scarf off and put it over the top of that cup. And I looked and my mom looked and then he went over after he had danced around it and he pulled the scarf off. And he, I told my mother to look in there and she did. We looked in there and there was my great grandpa on a toboggan going across the river up on the other bank safely. Now, old Jenny was telling me this story when she got a new TV from her grandson. Well, it was secondhand, but it was new to her. She said, this is a, not the first time I saw TV. So she told us about the first time she had experienced an image in something else than just in front of her. It was in the water in that cup. So that's the type of stories that we make reference to and how the spirituality of that community is dependent upon the unity of the prayers and this man who took on the responsibility and had this gift to be a visionary. There's many of these beautiful stories. I don't have enough time to tell you them all. And many of these stories have been lost. And I'm trying to encourage as many people as I can, if you are befriending Indigenous people, to somehow have them, help them, be of service to record these old stories. Because many have not been recorded. And they're very precious. These, these are the history of Canada in a certain segment of our society. So the story I'm going to tell you tonight, and you're not going to just, you know, listen to a story. You are going to work. I keep saying this to my friends. I'm going to put you to work. It's not all just spoon fed. And I should tell you that when you hear the story that I'm going to tell you, you, the first thing that will come to your mind, just write it down. And this story will evolve. That's another, what I refer to as a wondrous aspect of traditional stories, is that today I hear the story the spiritual meanings come to me. I see all kinds of cultural things that have gone on. 
and next month I have more understanding. It grows. The story imparts its inner meanings to you. So this story is uh, for my grandma's cousin and it's, it's for my grandma too. The story is called Atsanman. Atsanman. Can you say that? Try it. Atsanman. It feels so good in my mouth to speak this language that I don't have anybody else to speak to. Atsan. That means old woman. Man means lake. Atsanman. <laughs> now. When I was a young woman, I was very much involved with land claims, research with my people. I would go and interview elders. I would take a map and I would ask them, where did you travel? What were you hunting for? What kind of fish did you get? Who was born at this camp? who was buried nearby, and we'd place all of this on, a, on the map. And, and I would record the elders. So one day I was at Lucy Cho's place. Remember I mentioned the word Cho? Lucy Cho means big Lucy. She was a big woman. She was the tallest woman in our village. I don't know how she grew to be so tall but she was very tall, because the rest of us are not so tall. But Cho, for her, meant she, she was very knowledgeable. So I went to their home, and her husband, um, Sam, Giling Shan, they called him, he showed me all the places on the map. And then he showed me a little tiny lake there, and we looked at it with a magnifying glass, because he couldn't see that well. And he said, is this the one they call a reed lakes? And he pointed. I said, yes, that, it says right there that's a reed lakes. What you call it? He said, that's a atsanman. That's an old woman's lake. You know, used to be woman lived there by herself. She's a healer. And people who are healers, they don't live in the camp with the rest of the people. They live by themselves. She's got her little camp there. She's got her little sweat lodge. She gets a sweat lodge rocks when she's sweat by herself. She gathers things to heal the people. That reed lakes too, he said, very important to the people because when it gets dark in the fall time, because as you know, in the Yukon is daylight all night in the summer. So pretty soon darkness come home, he said. We start to get dark. And that's when we fish. And we take those tall reeds that grow in that lake and we make a torch. We gather them, all those reeds together. We tie them up. Then we dip them into fat. And we use our little flint. We make a little fire and then we catch that torch on fire. We go down by the lake. We hold that fire there. Fish, he likes that light. He rushed to it and we throw him out. So they fished with lit torches in those days. And there's several lakes in that region there that they would get these reeds from and tie them together. Yeah, he said that time, you know, my daddy, he got sick. So my brother and I, we, we make little bed, you know, they call that stretcher at the hospital, he said. We make that with 
moose hide and poles we put our daddy on there and we take him way up in a bush to Atsan Man. That old lady was there. I don't know how long we're there. Maybe 10 days, I don't know, he said. Pretty soon my daddy, he feel better. He's still pretty weak though, so my brother and I, we carried him back out to the camp. Oh, we hear about it in that camp. That old lady, she's got a baby boy. We asked my daddy, how she get baby boy? He said, not your business. Now apparently the story goes that the old lady she took her boy for a walk down by the lake. And as you all know, if you have a body of water and if you have rocks and a little child, those rocks in the lake, they'll always meet. Kids are going to start throwing the rocks, throwing the rocks, giving those little rocks to the lake. Every place in the world is like this. So that's, of course, what the little boy start to do. Pick up the rocks, throw it up there. And his mom is walking there with her cane. She's old lady. But she's looking around on the edge for sweat rocks, special kind of rocks that do not explode when they get hot. She's looking for those. Looking around, so. She wasn't paying attention to her boy. Her boy was thrown in the stones into the little lake. And she just looked back like that and here a big fish came, jackfish. <laughs> Grab her boy. Hey, she said, come back with my boy. She hollered to that fish, big giant jackfish. Already he's gone. She got busy. She had little stone axe. She started cutting down little spruce trees around her. She limbed them. And at the bottom of the spruce tree, there's dried brush and that can catch fire really fast. She had her little pile of sweat rocks piled up there for the future. And she started with all of those little poles that she had limbed, she started making little rafts winding it she had she had all of this spruce root great big roll of it down by the lake and she started making little small rafts and on those rafts she put that little dried spruce limbs and on top of that dried spruce she put her sweat rocks i don't know how many rafts she made the old man told me, lots. She don't give up. Pretty soon she got her torch and her flint. A fire going. So she lit the first raft. She pushed the raft out into the water and she lit that little dried spruce brush. Pushed the raft out. Pretty soon she pushed another raft. Another one. Because it was a small lake, pretty soon the whole lake was on fire. It looked like it was on fire. All these rafts are burning, burning. That fresh pitch is just like gas heating up those rocks. And once the spruce burned and disintegrated, all those hot rocks started dropping into the water, dropping, heating the water. Pretty soon that water was almost boiling. <sighs> that big jackfish surface. The old lady ran out there. She had, a, she had cut a limb, a branch, and she grabbed it by its gills and she dragged it back to shore. 
She didn't have much time. Her boy was in the belly of the fish. She cut it open with her knife, spread open its guts. Too late. Already, that boy had been digested. There's just bones there. She didn't stop there. She went and got some of that fresh spruce boughs, laid them out. She got her fresh moose hide from her camp. She brought it there and she laid it on top of the spruce boughs and tenderly, lovingly, carefully, she laid the bones on top of that moose hide. The little skull, little collarbone, arms, ribs, legs. She laid it all out. And she wrapped the bones of her boy. She wrapped him very nicely. And she began to sing over the bones. Ah. Yeah, <laughs> I see that old lady, she sang for four days and four nights, and she never stopped. Never ate, and she never slept. And the old man said on the fifth morning, a little boy came out. And he said, do you look around here now in this town? You know that little boy? Some of his relatives are here. What does that story mean? When I teach my course on mentoring, I say harvest this story. We harvest our food. We harvest our berries from the land, the animals, the fish, fur-bearing animals. We harvest wood. Now, how do you harvest story? I told you I was going to make you work. <laughs> so, if you want to unmute yourself, I think there's somebody talking here in the chat. Please let me know who it is. Now you can add me. Anybody wish to take courage? I should also preface this, this invitation with this comment. And I always say this when I'm working with non-Indigenous people. There are no incorrect answers. You are all looking at it from your own worldview. I'm looking at it from my own worldview. The story took place probably, I don't know, 200 years ago. So every answer is correct. When I go to the school and I tell stories, the children love that. Nobody here gets a big X. It's all correct. 
or whoever would like to. Can I try? Please. Uh, the story to me means that uh, life is, um, is hard work. And if we are uh, going to, to keep the ones around us that we love, it's going to be, um, it's going to take everything we've got, morning and night, to, to make sure that those loved ones are, um, are nurtured and cared for and, and given what they need. And you have to watch them every minute because a fish will come and get them any minute. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Messi. Messi too. I can add something. Um, and thanks, Sandy. Hopefully, I'm one of those that you love that you'll be watching over. Um, the story You're the fish. <laughs> <laughs> the fish. Oh my gosh. Um, the story for me had the themes of um, loss and search and hope. And as Sandy said, the effort, like the hope that the boy would return and the, the, the faith and hope. But it's, to me, it's, it's a very uh, similar theme to searching for your love. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Maureen. Anybody else? Um, uh, to me, it was the story of how woman is the creator and you know, she's, she's the one whose will can actually um, affect the alchemy of nature. Exactly. We're the ones that give birth. <laughs> it's, it's so, so true. Thank you. Thank you. It's exciting. Um, somebody's got his hand up. I'm, I, your name, you have an initial G. Perima. Yeah. Yes. yes. When there is love, there is always life. There is no end of life. Mm. Thank you. It's true. Eternal. No end of life. Thank you. It's, uh, if, if, if you look in the context of the residential schools and what's happening in the what's happened in the last few hundred years uh, to the indigenous people, if you think about that boy as being the, the future of the indigenous people, maybe we can think of it as terms of they, in a sense, they, they're, many things have been destroyed in their livelihood and their culture. And, but through, through prayer and through spiritual infusion, new life mm -hmm. can come to them. And we, you know, maybe that's part of the meaning of the story. Thank you. Very insightful. Thank you. Anybody else? Louise, there is a comment in the chat from oh, okay. Farnaz and Ali asking, is this a lesson on perseverance? Yes, yes. We must not give up. We must not give up. I'm sure that the last, uh, the last two messages from the Universal House of Justice uh, is reminding us of that, that no matter what happens, we must not give up. Thank you, whoever gave those answers of perseverance. Keep going, you know, like the old lady, she just kept going, nothing would stop her. She, she was on a roll. Uh, Louis, um, yeah. I think listening to that story till the end, it, it creates a different consciousness for us that whatever we believed before, the finality of death, or so many other ideas that we 
for us, it was just as sure as the light, you know, in the day could be changed in a matter of second. So it's a totally different look and view in life. Thank you. I honor that old woman in all of us. Each one of us has the old woman in us. And we have that torch. And we have to keep our flint close at hand to keep that torch, to keep the fire in our eyes. This is our job. We're like the lighthouses. Yeah, I've always wanted to paint that picture of the, the, the lake on fire with the old woman's form, you know, watching, watching the, the little lake on fire and be beautiful. Well, if you have any questions for me, I will try to answer them then, but as I always say when I, when I share stories, um, this, the questions that I cannot answer, I won't. <laughs> Sometimes people ask me questions and I say, oh, I, I don't really know. And then they'll ask me the same question, but in a different way. And then I, I can't answer the questions that I can't. I will try to answer them questions, but only the ones that I can. Another or, hand. Maureen, do you have your hand up again? I, I do. I mean, my question is, while this story has different layers of meaning and uh, interpretations, I'm wondering if there is a um, an actual interpretation that is meant through the story. <laughs> is there an answer? <laughs> you know, um, every culture has its own sort of symbology, etc. So I'm wondering if this story really was meant to convey a specific lesson or teaching. This is the beauty of these stories. And um, I'm sorry I wasn't clear when I was sharing this with you is that every story is heard by different ears. You know, Bahala asks us to look at the world through our own eyes, hear through our own ears and seek truth for ourselves. And so each person coming to the story, what you've interpreted as is for you the truth. And so for me to say this story means this, is to almost kill the story. Because every person who hears the story, and the story was, um, you know, in fact, as, as a child, I'm sure we would all hear this story uh, totally different. And then when we get older, we understand it with more life experience. Um, perhaps we've even been to that little lake, so that would, put on a whole new cloak of something else, something different. Yeah, so this is the beauty of these stories is that there is never just one meaning at one time that I say, okay, this story at San Man is about that. It's about many things. Like you, you learn through the story, how did they make fire? What did they make fire with? Flint, okay? So that means that there, there must have been a flint deposit nearby for these people to learn to go there to get flint. So flint, uh, what about, um, at what time of the year did people go fishing? And where did they go to get these reeds for fishing? Like there's so many lessons, so many lessons in that. And um, the fact, you know, right at the very onset, I said, you know, this woman did not live in the, in the camp with the people. And I asked, uh, I asked 
uh, Lucicho, why was that? And she said, she's got to keep clean, meaning that she can't have other people's uh, spirit, I suppose, distracting her from her job as, an, as a medicine woman, as a person whose job it was, was to try and heal people. Yeah, so there's, I mean, I've never done an analysis of all the things that just my little puny brain would interpret. But if we took all of your understandings, this would be so big. <laughs> I see Sandy, Sandy Smith has her hand up and Farnes and Ali have their hand up. So Sandy, would you like to go first, please? Um, so may I ask you, you were saying that uh, this story is for us to, to grow through in whatever way we need to grow um, with that story. Uh, how do you feel then? Um, is, is it our story now? You've told us that story. Have you given it to us? Or, or is it still your story? Um, can, we, can, we, can we use this story? I always say to those that have heard these stories that these stories are now your stories. You are responsible for them. Mm -hmm. You must care for them. You must pray for them. You must share them. And if you remember them, this is how you can do it. If you do not remember all of the story, even if you just remember a short part of the story, small part of the story, uh, you can share that. Oftentimes people are hesitant to say that. Uh, but I'm, I'm a storyteller that I say, whatever you can remember, please share with other people. If you feel that it will encourage them, that it will uplift them, that it will also educate them about Indigenous people, this is, uh, yeah, it, I think it's, it's a gift for you. I give this gift to you from my ancestors tonight. Thank you. You're welcome. Farnaz? Thank you. I just um, wanted to ask um, if I found, uh, I found interesting that you said that she didn't live in the with the others and, and you explained why. And then I'm thinking now to myself that would that be related to what we see, uh, what we call like compassion fatigue, burnout, those type of things that they, they like it's a, for me, it seems that it's also a lesson on how to be moderate and, and, and not um, overdo something. Um, so that you can preserve your own own health, own health to be able to help others in their health without having that compassion fatigue. That, that sounds very practical, very logical to me. Um, yeah. I, I think that, you know, she was a healer. Um, People honored her, uh, but people knew that she had to really work at it. And in order to do so, in order to, to really be able to focus, to really be able to uh, call on the higher power so she can do this work, she uh, chose to do that, to be outside of the community. Okay, so Marianne, you have your hand up. Um, I, I think it, it's so interesting because, um, you know, you had to say for non-Indigenous people, I always want to say there's no wrong answer. And I find that so interesting because um, we do come from this culture. It's um, a culture of punishment. So you have to either have, you either, it's either right or wrong. It's either black or white. You have to find the answer. And so I think there's an answer. You have to analyze, analyze what we teach you, analyze what we tell you. Um, but you have to be right. 
if you analyze, you can't, you come, you can't come out with your own right answer. You have to come out with our right answer, but you still have to analyze. And I think that the indigenous culture, and I love this word that you used because I harvesting, it's harvesting the story, not analyzing the story, right? And it's not about a right answer or a meaning. It's about, and this is obviously my interpretation of it, but I think one of the things that I really um, think that is so important is how you feel when you're listening to the story. It's like searching in yourself about how you feel when you hear about the woman and the boy. Like every little part of that story will touch um, everybody's personal story in such a special way. So your story of, of you will connect with the story of that woman, right? And for me, for example, that's that part where, you know, um, the beginning where your um, the man asks his, his um, I guess he asked his, whoever he asked the elder, how does she have this old woman? How did she get a boy? Like, to me, that touched, like, that was where it connected with me, right? Like, oh, you know, like, if that connected with me, like, oh, she's this old woman that I guess nobody expects to be able to have kids, but she has this boy, like, that connected with me. I guess it didn't really connect with anybody else, because nobody really talked about that part of the story. But for me, that was the part of the story that I was like, like, and then I, I just thought about how I felt at that part of the story, and how your voice was, right? I think, the idea of the storyteller and how you tell the story too is so important. So it's not really about the us trying to figure out, figure it out, like conquer it, conquer the story, right? Because we have a conquering culture and indigenous culture is not a conquering culture. It's not a punishing culture. And we come from such a conquering and punishing culture that we are not even able to relax into a culture that gives us that like that's real it's it's holding its arms out to us to, to we don't have to have a right answer we don't have to conquer this story just be with this story yeah. just just be with your emotions in this story and i like and it was interesting because i would never have come to this like I would never have thought about the things the way I think about them. Um, but I met this girl in, in Montreal and um, she was indigenous and she was talking to me about, um, you know, when the whole idea of, of the land, you know, buying land from indigenous people. And she said, we didn't have, we didn't understand ownership. So we just thought they, they need this land for what they need it. Okay, they can, if they need it, they can have it. And it just stuck with me, like not understanding ownership. Like there was no concept of ownership. Can we, let's like, you know, re reset us back to factory settings, you know? How can we live without understanding? We can't, can you go through one day and not understand ownership and, and erase ownership from your mind? it's, it's almost impossible, you know? And so what I, like, for me, this story was all about wonder, like a sense of wonder, like one, you know, it's don't look for, and don't, don't, you don't have to find, like, you don't, you're, it's not a culture of like, it's a culture of wonder and oneness. And one wonder and oneness are not about finding something. They're about being with something. Sorry. That was just... I, lo I love how you brought those two words together. Wonder and oneness. Yeah. And, uh, and this is why I suppose this is why I'm so passionate about teaching stories teaching people how to tell their own story so that you can sit, sit with your story. And it is only your story. Like only you can tell your story. And it's up for you to share it. So, yeah. 
This has been such a beautiful evening. I just love it. I've learned so much about this story from all of you. And uh, yeah, that's a great way to spend a Thursday evening <laughs> with all of you. So Louise, there is a question yeah. um, from Valerie. She asks, dear Louise, is there a possibility to reconnect with you after this session? Yes. Uh, so, uh, okay, yeah, that's, so. Yeah, yeah uh, I'll, I'll just, uh, what I'll do with Valerie is I'll just put my phone number in, in the chat for you, okay? Dr. Valerie Down is one of our nicest, nicest and loveliest friend. And, and she comes when she feels better. And when I look at her face, when the light is there and she's smiling, I know she's feeling well. So okay. today one of those was one of those days that I realized that Valerie feels good. I'm so glad. I just, Valerie, I just left you my uh, phone number. You can definitely phone me afterwards. I'm here all evening, so. Okay.